Well, it is a beautiful day on Melrose Mountain. Uh, the temperatures are in the upper 60s. Low humidity, sun is out. It is beautiful, very, very, very nice day. We're looking at the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, uh, the communion, the Holy Communion. And uh, let's take a look first at Exodus 12 uh, and look at the very verses that we should pay close attention to. I ask you to look at this as typology a shadowy picture of what Jesus would fulfill in the New Testament and to see how many parallels you could find. But let's take a look at the key verses, uh, first of all, in Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, talks about a new calendar. The Jewish calendar would begin with this command of Christ, uh, excuse me, this command of God uh, in the Passover, a new calendar. Verse 3, uh, we find on the 10th day of that new month, a new calendar, uh, they would take a lamb. And uh, so lamb becomes one of our key words. Uh, number, verse 5 would say an unblemished one-year-old male lamb. That's pretty specific, isn't it? And so we look at that verse, verses 2, 3, and 5 so far. Verse 6, keep it until the 14th day. So they would keep it for four days. Uh, and then in verse 6 also, it was to be killed at twilight killed at twilight. So we have lamb, we have twilight, we have a keeping of a short time. Verse 7, uh, we have an emphasis on the blood being applied to the doorpost of the home. So we have another term, blood, we have lamb, uh, twilight, blood, short time of keeping. Uh, we have unleavened bread in verse 8. In verse 11, we have the way we're to eat it, our loins girded, sandals on our feet, and staff in our hand. Verse 11, verse 13, the blood is a sign. The blood is a sign for the death angel to pass over. Verse 14, uh, it, it's to be a, a day of, uh, of celebration, a feast to the Lord, and, and it's a orda ordained uh practice, a permanent practice, an eternal practice. Verse 15, seven days of unleavened removed from the home. Uh, verse 21, directions to the people that by faith they're going to have to go out and apply this blood to the doorpost of their home if the death angel is going to pass by. Verse 24, an ordinance forever. Verse 25, entering the land uh, the kingdom of God, or into the promised land in the case of the Passover. Verse 26, explain it to your children. Verse 27, it's uh, to be a, a worship experience uh, for what God has done. Verse 30, there'll be a great divide. There will be death on one side of Egypt and sorrow and grieving, and there'll be rejoicing on the other side. Uh, verse 37, uh, a freedom to go to the promised land, the freedom of the people after 400 years of uh, oppression. Verse 43, uh, who is to eat this meal? Uh, it goes on from verse 43 all the way through verse 45. No foreigner, no sojourner, no uncircumcised. Uh, and so we have uh, all of these points coming out of one chapter. In the Old Testament, a shadowy picture of what Jesus would fulfill in his teaching. So now let's go back and take a look at the New Testament parallels. The Lamb, the Lamb in John 1.29 and also 1.36, the Lamb of God. Seven times in the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God. Uh, the male Lamb, it, there was to be a son that would be born that would be the Messiah. Matthew 1.21, a son would be given to us, and, uh, and that's made clear in the scriptures. Unblemished. Hebrews 4.15 says he was tempted in every way as we are tempted, and yet without sin. So we see this beautiful parallel of the unblemished lamb being our sacrifice. One year old in the prime of life, and a, and a lamb would be an adult at one year. Uh, Jesus was an adult, age 30 to 33 in the prime of life, just as a one-year-old lamb would be. Be kept for a short time. Jesus' public ministry was only three years, a time to get attached, and a time of great sorrow for those that knew him and had been uh, visited in his ministry. Crucified or killed at twilight, 
Uh, we see the darkness at the sixth hour, that would be three o'clock, and we know that, <coughs> excuse me, the haste that he was taken down from the cross, Matthew 19, 31, uh, so that the, the new day, the new Sabbath, would not be yet started. That would be twilight. The blood, well, we find blood in uh, Hebrews 9, 12, 9, 22, Romans 5, 9, and Colossians 1, 20. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so we see this uh, significance of the blood of the Lamb. And then by faith, we find that in uh, Mark eleven twenty two, Luke seven fifty, Romans three twenty five, Ephesians two eight and nine, that it is by the blood of the Lamb uh, that we find through faith, not of works, lest anybody should boast. Uh, it's got to be by faith. Explanation to the children. Certainly we're taught in old Proverbs 22.6 to train up a child. But in Ephesians 6.4 it also tells parents to train their children. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a worship service where uh, we had the Lord's Supper and I see little children leaning over and asking their mom and dad, why the little cracker? Why the little glass of juice? Uh, what a wonderful teaching opportunity that then becomes later in the evening. Uh, for the mother and father to go home and explain exactly what's gone on in the Lord's Supper and what the significance is. And uh, worship, well, every time you think about the price that Christ paid for us, for our sins, uh, we should worship him anew and afresh. And of course, that's one of the major things that we should get out of the Lord's Supper. The great divide, the grief in Egypt and the, and the rejoicing at the same time, we find that in uh, the New Testament in the Matthew 25, 32, where we see the sheep separated from the goats and we see the tares separated from the wheat in Matthew 13. Uh, there's going to be a great separation. Those that believe and those that don't believe, those that have applied the blood and those that haven't applied the blood and the difference uh, that they will find. Freedom and the promised land, uh, John 8, 36 and Colossians 1, 5. Uh, certainly teach us uh, that Jesus has come to set us free and he's come to promise us eternal life in heaven. Now, one of the most controversial areas of the Lord's Supper in many churches is who may eat. Some churches say only people of our denomination uh, may participate in our particular practice. Others say only people in our church, even if they're people are of, of the same denomination but come from a different church, are invited to join in uh, with the uh, or, ordained meal or the sacrament. And uh, some have said that that comes from this no foreigner, no uncircumcised, no sojourner, uh, and have made this restriction. But I would suggest to you that uh, I believe that is false teaching. Uh, I believe that the teaching we can get out of the guidelines from Exodus is that the person is to be a believer one who has trusted in Christ, applied the blood of Christ to their lives, and one who believes that Jesus is the Messiah and has repented from their sins and accepted him as Savior. And I believe that 1 Corinthians brings the, the separation of who may participate and who may not. I believe that 1 Corinthians teaches very clearly that the significance is, yes, you must be a believer, but even more than being a believer, you ought to be in a place of being confessed up and being righteous before God. That means a time of self-examination. I think if you read 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30, you'll find that that's one of the most critical elements uh, that Paul is making the point to the Corinthian church. Get your heart right before you take the Lord's Supper. Don't come having uh, animosity towards people in the church, your mate, your children, that don't come with sin that's not been confessed and then eat unworthily of the Lord's Supper, but rather have it be a time, a significant time of self-examination, confession, and repentance uh, before you take of the meal. I believe that it's open to all believers, uh, regardless of denomination. I think it's open to all believers who have examined themselves and uh, truly want to remember uh, this new covenant that God has made with us through the blood of Jesus. That's your thought for the day. And if you want to prepare for tomorrow, take a look now 
at uh, why uh, do we participate in the Lord's Supper? What is what is the significance of this meal? Uh, is there another name that we could give to it that uh, might be uh, even more descriptive name uh, than the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion or the Eucharist? And uh, you know we've seen when. Now we need to look a little closer at why, and then finally we'll look at the warnings again in a little more detail. That's your thought for the day. God bless you and have a great day.